All right, good morning and welcome back to the Game Dev Show, everybody. I'm here today with Andrew, Powell, Greg, and Will. We're going to be talking about a couple new announcements, some things that were just released. And uh, if Story hops in, we might be talking a little bit about his AI image generation adventures as well. I don't know if he's going to be here, but it looks kind of interesting. So good morning. Welcome, everybody. How are you guys doing today? Oh, that's me. Doing good. My that's sound good. is on. <laughs> yeah, mine You're- too. <laughs> oh, oh, on the stream? Yeah, I had to, I had to mute it. Right <laughs> yeah, that happens to me all, all the time. Yeah. So um, there's a bunch of big stuff going on this week, a couple really big announcements. Um, I've got one I want to share in a little bit. But before we get to that, I wanted to start with Andrew's big announcement, which was the release of Andrew's new projectile system. You want to tell everybody what that is while I calm this dog down, Andrew? Yes. The projectile factory is a behavior-based um, projectile system that essentially lets you... I can actually... I'm on my OBS now, so I should just, I should just bring this over here and just press play and show you. Uh, so basically, it's a behavior-based projectile system allowing you to unify your projectiles into one system and then mix and match and do the behaviors based on just behavior objects that you can make, bring in and out rather than having to set up individual projectiles. So like this this one rather, not that one. This one will chase things just because it has a homing behavior on that. So we can quickly see that by going to our projectile actor here in our inspector. I'll turn off this. And then we can see that they've got these projectiles right here. And this projectile arcane missile has these behaviors. And these are the magical behaviors. So you can just add new behaviors in. You can search for all your different behaviors. You can create new behaviors. You can script entirely new behaviors that are very specific to your game. um, And just replace things to create brand new projectiles. So behavior-based projectile system works with every projectile in the history of the world. <laughs> and um, and uh, yeah, it makes it just very easy to use them in a game versus, you know, um, versus having, having to code them all yourself. <laughs> yeah, that, um, versus having to code all of them yourself. And that that's the big thing that, that got me when I start, first started making this. I was a little unhappy with the amount of boilerplate code that some of these particles came with to the point where either you had two choices if you wanted to use them. <laughs> you could either uh, recreate the particles effects from scratch, meaning take their component pieces, figure out how they were meant to go together, and then recreate that with your own scripts, or take their scripts and redo their scripts so that they actually are extensible and can be used in an actual project. Um, Pavel, in particular, was was well aware of my complaining one night, spending five hours doing that with one package. It looked great in the end, and now you can just drag things over and use them with any character or object that spews out projectiles. It works perfectly in every single situation now. But it took five hours of of refactoring code to redo uh, essentially scripts that weren't made by a developer. They were made for a demo scene specifically, and they were very much hard-coded the names of the projectiles were in the scripts. Like you couldn't change the name of the projectile game object that would break the script. So, um, yeah. Uh, but Hey, this makes everyone's life better. So nice. So kind of solved that and made it work with all of the different projectile particles, right? Yeah, exactly. And now, and there are six integrations with popular particle packages that if you happen to have the particle package, which most likely if you've been buying stuff from the asset store and mega bundles and whatnot, you probably have a few of them. Uh, if you've got those and you got projectile factory, bring in the integration and you have projectiles that are just ready to go. You can oh, sweet. drag them and drop them. I, I did this on the stream last night because the whole point of this, I've, I made this for my own game, Legend of the Stones. So last night in my little party stream, I brought into legend of the stones we have flying eye which you know jason you've got flying eye in your game that you're working i on certainly do uh, and so i put a projectile spawner on the flying eye i brought the projectile over wrote the code that says if it sees the the bad the, the player every one second fire a projectile and it just worked and the projectiles just fired and that was it that was all it was just a few steps and that that's the promise of this system so 
hopefully other people will find that valuable as well. Nice. I'm sure lots of people will. They want to get in and, and do projectiles. It's one of the first things I feel like people put in the game after they start running around and they want to shoot stuff. And yeah. projectiles are a, a, a big part of that. So it's it's interesting and pretty cool that you put that together for everybody. Uh, I put the link in there. We'll put it in the description as well so everybody can check it out. Um, so, you, uh, that's not the best part of it, though. What's, what's the that? best part? The music video. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I'm pretty sure this is the first asset in the history of the world for Unity that has its own theme song. <laughs> it might be. Now, there was a question, does it include lock-on features? So it homing can. projectiles, that's in there, so right? There, there is a behavior that, so there's behaviors that will follow a target. So you can switch the target, you can set the, it'll inherit the target that the spawner has. So if your player is, has a targeting system, it'll inherit that target. But you can also change the target runtime. So you could do an entire matrix thing where all the projectiles suddenly stop, change target, and then follow that new target back to the whoever spawned it. So you could do lots of things with that. So the the behaviors are are where this comes into play. You the the one I showed there, the homing will it's a lock on target. Basically, it homes in on the on the target. You could make it also um, there's a look at target behavior as well so that instead of just homing in which has an a max angle meaning if it's going fast enough it can just fly around the target because it's too fast and can't turn um, but you can do a look at one where it's just constantly looking at the target no matter where the target goes it'll look at it and that'll go straight to the target um, and then there's also like a behavior that will attach it to the target so once it hits the target it will parent itself to that target like a sticky bomb this was a request from one of the lovely viewers on a stream they're like oh does it have a sticky bomb so i quickly wrote a thing <laughs> that says literally on collision enter parent to the object you collide with so now there's a sticky bomb thing and so it, the how the projectiles actually act is based on these number of behaviors that you add together um and the the, the only difference between a sticky bomb and a non-sticky bomb is that one behavior does it, you know, add that one behavior and now it attaches to it and everything else stays the same. So you can nice. just mix and match things. And, and, and then literally when you want to create a new one, it's, you know, you just override one, one method and your new behavior scripts are one method. You know, if you want to get complex, you can make them longer, but they, you know, most of them are just one method. Where they override on you just create a new behavior override that one thing and add it in nice yep. and then it shows up in your in your list and you can expect the the um variables are exposed in the inspector so you don't even have to leave the projectile inspector to change the, the behavior details even though you're editing the details is on a different object entirely so it should be very easy to use uh, nice for folks to yeah. speed people up a lot. I mean, that's one of the main reasons I use assets to get all this stuff kind of done and working as quick as possible. I've got a ton in uh, in my game right now. So I'll talk a little bit more about those later. Though. Um, Greg, what's going on with you, man? Well, um, I am working still on my math game for Legends of Learning. I pretty much have the gameplay from beginning to end done i'm working on a screen to allow the players so for those that don't know it's it's, it's a math game with basic multiplication and division for like eight to eleven year olds so I, i'm working on a screen to review the problems they got wrong um and and the game features what they call fact families so you know a times B equals C can also be B times A equals C or C divided by A equals B or C divided by B equals A. <clears throat> so the review screen is going to arrange the problems they've missed into the facts family that puts the question mark on the right side of the equation to show them because that's much easier to solve if the question marks on the right side of the equation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so that's what I'm working on now. And after that, it's just going to be a lot of testing and optimization um, and I think I mentioned before that the entire uncompressed build size has to be less than 30 megabytes. So, yeah, so you, I know you had to keep it down. That's why you went back to built in, right? Yeah, I got rid of the uh, URP and went back to built in. And um, so far, I'm still under 30 megabytes. So, and I've been adding some additional sound and, and music and stuff. And so, that's the challenging thing. I can't really have a music clip this longer than like 30 seconds because it starts to blow up. You make some MIDI files instead, right? <laughs> some of the nice and tiny. 
That's funny. 30 megabytes. I, I think like I was looking at my project last night and I've shrunk it down to 50 gigs. <laughs> I was like, Oh yeah, it's actually way smaller than I thought. I shrunk it. That's only, it's only 50 gigs. And the, uh, the build is only a little over two gigs and it's up on steam too. So mm -hmm. I got, got that all working. Hopefully you guys were all able to grab it with one of the codes. Um, all right, now uh, uh, Will's been sitting down there in the corner quietly, and I want to jump over to him now because uh, it's first time on the show. Really excited to have you here. You want to tell everybody what it is you're working on? Yeah, I can talk about it. Um, so, I mean, some people will say, "Oh, are you going to come and talk about Unity?" Uh, not really. I, I, I talk about it a lot. I talk about it on Twitter all the time, and people can ask about that if they want to. We can talk about Unity. Um, I'm working on a game uh, with my friend Sean. Shout out to Sean Peoples, um, aka Durham Games. And uh, we're making a stealth survival game in Unity in HDRP. And Ooh. it's based around a, a story about a, well, at the moment, you know how things change, right? Yes. At the moment, <laughs> it's a stealth game. It's going to end up being a 2D match game. Uh, yes, no, it's now a first-person shooter in an RTS. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It turned out to be a uh, haiku game. No. Uh, so at the moment, we're, we're trying to build this, this world which... I guess I'm kind of inspired by games like Inside, where you've kind of got a lot of incidental storytelling in the background, but you don't really explicitly ever get told what's happening in this weird environment that you're in. So um, I started out with this this prototype. Uh, it's been two years, actually, um, a couple of years ago, where I'd, I'd taken the, you know, the third person starter assets thing that, that Unity shipped? Because, I, you know, I don't want to make a character. I just wanted to grab a character. And the mechanic I wanted to test out was a flaming torch that diminished over time. And so we started with this idea that you'd have to kind of add more fire to see where you're going to navigate and to solve all these puzzles. And I just made a kind of a, a character mangling game with all sorts of gruesome traps and things. Um, and then now bringing Sean on board, it was really nice. I just, I just re I've known Sean in the community since like, I think we met at Unite Vancouver, if anybody remembers that. Was that like... 2015 something a like long that. time ago <laughs> venue, i remember there was like a lego whale outside made out of like voxel whale like if anybody remembers this word play anyway uh met sean back then and then uh he's he started working at unity a couple of years ago or maybe less than that but um i just reached out to him at the start of the year and he said oh how was your you know how are your holidays and uh and i said yeah great i'm working on this game and he's what is it and um he said, I'll work on it. And I'm like, oh, yes, a real programmer. I'm, a real programmer. I'm a really crappy programmer, which uh, he soon learned as he was refactoring lots of my terrible mistakes. But um, we're having a really good time. And uh, it's it's proving to be one of those things where, you know, you kind of get a bit obsessed with details. And so I've been, you know, relearning all of our systems. Like uh, I spent four hours the other night just perfecting hands as the guy picks up and moves a barrel around, you know, like animation rigging and all that stuff. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, you get kind of obsessive about like, well, the hand's not quite oriented right there. So you have to <laughs> move things around. Um, but yeah, having loads of fun with it. And uh, it's been really nice to have a collaborator. Like I said, I've been working on it for a couple of years. And I think being, I don't, you guys know this pretty well, you know, when you're a solo dev, it can be really challenging to motivate yourself. Even showing builds to friends and stuff was nice, but it wasn't like, let's bounce the ideas back and forth. Whereas um, with Sean mm -hmm. in that now, it's really, really good fun. Yeah, you've got another, another head there to talk about and go, go with, go over all the ideas and kind of brainstorm with yeah. you. You <laughs> didn't have chat GPT the whole time. huh? <laughs> As your co-developer. I'm going to be honest with you before I, at the start of the year, I was working on another idea, which is why Andrew's projectile packs really exciting for me because you know, people love a side, side, side project. <laughs> of course. Uh, I had this other game I was working on uh, a few years ago, which was like a tile based game where you were these robots who would fire sticky bombs and um, you fire them and they were like bombs a kind of bomber man style, but they bounced around. And then you could press fire again and it would stick them to the ground. It's really satisfying mechanic. Um, but I kind of never got anywhere with that prototype. So I might be looking at Andrew's pack and thinking, yeah, I'll do two projects at once. Why not? <laughs> <I'm an idiot. laughs> Only two? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Lazy, right? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> only two, only two projects and a job. You yeah. need at least a couple more jobs and uh, maybe a company or two on the side. Yeah, yeah. and a family, oh, and probably yeah. some friends. 
Yeah. 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 <laughs> Friends are useless. What are you talking about? Just, just projects and jobs. <laughs> now that's awesome. So the, uh, the game that you're working on now, does it have a final name and a, a page or a presence? People can go check it out yet. Or that's, that's the thing. There's, there's no presence yet. We've set ourselves a uh, date, um, which is like getting a, a vertical slice demo for, for next GDC. So, uh, we think we're, well, we're well on our way to, to the first sort of representative level working pretty well. Um, but yeah, I'm uh, not ready to kind of. Not ready to put it out there in front of people. Yeah. It's called it's Mary the... Pickles Private Eye, right? Yeah, that's right. This is because <laughs> when we got on the call earlier and they asked me, are you, are you, what's your, you know, are you here as Unity? Are you here as yourself? What's going on? And I said I was here as Barry Pickles, private investigator who'd joined the game dev industry to investigate a ring of, you know, but anyway, it's not actually true. You need to change your name and restream is the problem. Now everybody's not going to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good point, actually. I should do that. Um, but yeah, I, I'm kind of in two minds because Sean, he, he's a, he lives in, uh, in North Carolina. He's coming over to the UK on Sunday and uh, I made a poster for the game as kind of like motivation to give him as a gift. And it sat over there and I'm like, do I show it? Because it's such a fun thing. And I'm really excited about it. But I'm not I'm going to resist the urge uh, to do that. Because I want to kind of, you know, what it's like you promoting yourself. You want to get everything together, and and uh, maybe the name will change. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. I'm excited to see it when it's uh, when it's ready and, and get in and do some some sneak peek testing and stuff. And uh, oh, yeah. I'll send you guys a build. I, I'm ready oh, to, uh, to share. It's um, a PC PC game. Yeah, PC. <laughs> Hi, Andrew. It was it just complaining in chat. <laughs> it works on Mac if you like heat. Yeah, I don't mind. In other words, it's completely unoptimized. Yeah, I, I, I don't like being cold, so anything oh, go. I got solar, so electricity is free. Oh, okay. maybe I'll make you a, a Mac build too, Andrew. Yeah. I could totally make you a Mac build. I'm just being lazy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I can. I, I have to dig up an old Mac somewhere and see see if I got one. Fine, I can or your cloud build. I can load up the PC of mine is the hottest machine I have though. That yeah. thing is gets hot. Because it has a video card in it. Yeah, it's not up like the the hardware is just not optimized. It's it's just power all the way through, I suppose. So. Oh, it's the hardware's fault. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's not anything we did. Yeah, cool. Oh, that was cool. And then, pal, what's going on over there? What's new with Nature Manufacture? Mm, we are uh, <clears throat> making some small updates to the castle and working on the coast asset and the dam 2024 but we are still deciding if it will be dam free or dam 2024 oh okay yes. so lots of maths lots of uh, calculating strange equations and things similar to that no. oh interesting uh, that shit confuses the hell out of me, but it looks beautiful. So <laughs> I started playing around with uh, your lava and castle packs again earlier this week, too. Just trying to figure it out. I'm still really, really bad at making anything look good. I'm really good at making your levels look bad, though. If you need somebody <laughs> to do that ever, like I can go in and completely fuck up a terrain and, and make it look horrible um, pretty, pretty quickly, too. That's but I'm trying to figure this out. So, yeah, one of the things I was trying to do for the game... Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that now, is come up with the environment for it. So I sent it in chat, and um, I don't know, everybody in here at least probably should have found a code. I finally got the game up on Steam, and it's not in a good state at all, but it does work. It's playable. You can connect to a multiplayer game. You can battle each other, select your characters, build your build your characters, spawn things, swap out your towers, and all that stuff. Um it works. It's just kind of um, in a semi-ugly state right now, and the visuals are horrible. Um, I was going to do a quick demo, though, and show everybody what it looks like. Oh, I forgot that that was in there. So I'll do a screen share, and um, maybe I'll give out like a code to somebody watching the chat, too. So can you see the screen? 
Yes. What? All right, cool. So right now, obviously, this is my uh, my beautiful <laughs> connection menu. You can hit host, start up a game, or you can stop, and then you can go in as a client and then connect by IP. You got to port forward and all that. I haven't set up the lobby and relay stuff, but I'll probably do that this weekend, probably tomorrow. So it only takes like an hour or two, but I want to do direct connections first. So you go in as a host, select your characters. Oh, I added in uh, some new characters oh, yesterday. Yeah. Um, but I screwed up my UI, so now the proto factor ones fell off the screen. So I got to fix that. You can go pick all your characters, um, whatever you want. Like I personally like. Oh, there's the eye. The eye has a screwed up shader on him, by the way, Andrew. I don't know what's going on there. The eye reflection when I import him to URP, it's like a white ball over him instead of looking normal. Sounds Just like a your problem. Yeah, it's a, it's when you do, do the conversion. Um, so you get the dragon. Uh, let's take Anubis and like the the moth chick has a heel. Uh, yep. And then go in. So it'll show all of the players here and all of their characters. I forgot to add in. There's a character, a player name, but I forgot to make the field visible so you can't see it. Uh, the character builds up off of all your stats. So you can see the stats. Or if I hit randomize, you see it changes constantly. So it's based on each the stats of each of these characters. And then each one's got an ability. Um, what did I pick here? Ah, whatever. Start. Log in. And if it works, okay. So this is the four player map. This is not the one that you have in the in the test build. And the goal here was oh come on. I gotta wait for everything to spawn. As soon as it all spawns, everything will kick over and totally break. Oh well, yeah. This is, <laughs> this is exactly my point. The whole thing broke it and now I, I can't move around. Let's let's go back out and go to the main menu. But it is mostly working, and in my tests, um, here, here's the, what happened to the UI? Okay, I broke something in the UI, in this one. The actual build version works, so you can run around, swap characters, um, do all of the combat, spawn things at the, pow at the spawners, you can swap out your towers and everything else, and just got to get a some level design going, uh, some actual level design, and then working on balance and stuff. But it's been... Um, fun and interesting putting this whole thing together and then the process of putting it up on steam took a whopping 30 minutes this morning um and yeah i was just having fun with it wanted to kind of show it off share it and then i'm going to put it out there soon for people to play publicly right now everybody on the show has access um and i'll start giving out access to other people soon i'm going to give access to everybody in the course this weekend as go through and we're going to talk about it a little bit more on on the calls on Monday, but um, yeah, anybody uh, got ideas or questions or have a chance to try it out and have it crash and blow up your computer yet? Not yet. I got it installed. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. I was gonna Are you going to use it. Lobby and Relay in it or just direct port to port? That's so yeah oh yeah, yeah so in 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 the end right now I've just got direct IP because it's mostly just me testing on my local network. Um, I'm gonna set up lobby and relay. I'm gonna do Steam integration probably this weekend for friends lists and all of that stuff. And then uh, the plan is support local hosted stuff, do dedicated servers eventually. Um, I mean, it works on dedicated servers now. I just don't want to set it up and pay for them because it's not monetized or anything yet. Um, but uh, allow people to just host their own servers, host dedicated servers and get in there and do all of the stuff. And then eventually allow for mods. And right now I've got 30 or so characters in here. I want to get a couple hundred and then have players be able to just submit their own. So um, starting like next week, I'm going to start taking submissions for character ideas with stats and abilities and links to uh, asset store models that I can pull in because I'm not going to go make a bunch of stuff. I want to have hundreds of characters in here. I want to just use stuff that already exists. There we go. Now it's running around and you can see there's a problem with this level and the navigation. I don't know what it is. Um, it's only on this level, but they stop navigating and start constantly. Every other level is fine. I think it might be something with my pro builder mesh or either that, or I screwed up something on the, the nav baking and I, I just haven't figured out what it is yet. But yeah, you can run around, um, go battle stuff. There's nobody on this level to kill, though. So I should really uh, switch it back to the, the one-player level. Um, yeah, that's kind of where the game's at. I hope to have it like in a fun, playable state within like the next week. Right now, it's in a functional, playable state where you can run around, do combat, everything 
dies, all of the core systems work and it's easy to just throw in content. It takes like less than five minutes to put in a new character, new abilities and stuff. Um, it's just got to get a, uh, Gotta, gotta get down to the fun now got it all functional so next week is the uh the fun and what what i found so far is that it's been a lot of fun running around oh i gotta switch this over to level one running around and taking control of things too so i may end up with uh with that as a core mechanic let me show you real quick so if i switch this up to load level one my tiny level um one of the things i added in as part of the the data binding setup is that you can just kind of shift click on any npc right now and take them over and then that becomes your character so you take them over they can swap between their different classes run around and then you can you know set them set their target make them go attack stuff so i was thinking about doing something uh as soon as it starts up something really similar like as a gameplay mechanic where you can take over your own creeps and control them but maybe you lose control of your character while you're doing it so he's just kind of standing there and then you can switch back and uh, be an extra thing that you can do and control still trying to figure it all out and for everybody who hasn't seen like the the overview of the game the idea is it's a mix of league of legends where you make your own champions instead of picking pre-made ones. So kind of like everybody's kind of like Uter. You switch between different modes and have different abilities based on that. And you can swap between them constantly at runtime. This is reloading really slow. I probably need to reboot Unity. I've had this problem lately where after a while, I just have to restart it. And then starting up takes like one second. Um, I think it's probably one of my plugins, but I'm not sure. Uh, and then so that's like one of the core parts of the game. The other thing was that you're going to be able to control the spawners so you can pick the NPCs that come out of the spawners the same exact way, kind of combine and make the things. And you can control and swap out your towers and build them kind of like a tower defense. And then the, the final, I think, really different change is that I want it to be solo teams. So you're, you're in there on, on your own, but against five or seven other people. So it's kind of like a big free for all. Everybody's pushing towards everybody else's lanes and trying to kill everybody at the same time with a, a fast gameplay. So if this ever starts, I will show you that, but I don't know if it's going to. I think, I, I think it, may have, uh, it may have just died and crashed. You broke the internet. Yeah, well, when it says a minute and 32 reloading domain, it means that uh, something, something has gone horribly wrong. No, that happens yeah. to me all the time. I've got it shouldn't happen. Each project I think of mine has a different random crash it happens or or like my main package always gets stuck on this one part when I load it up for the first time. Um, I forget which part off the top of my head, but there's, you know, Unity has a, all the little things that tells you what it's doing as it's loading up. There's one part, it, half the time it gets stuck, just quit, start it again. Generally, it works the second time. Yeah, I, I need to do more editor debugging. I feel like mine is probably just the fact that I constantly just hit add package. <laughs> like, uh, I feel like I, sometimes I might add too much stuff. And Dom, Dom such as IKEA, MOBA, a bit of everything. And this one, it was everything that I that I enjoy in the games. So that was that was the goal. Take all of the parts that I enjoy about the games and none of the parts that I don't enjoy, like character unlocking. And just be, you know, play a couple rounds, get get gold or whatever. Use that to unlock characters, or have you know microtransaction option to buy them for five bucks or whatever. But I'm gonna make it so that it's the same, um, like in, not not the the heavily monetized problems that all those other games have, where they they have to add in stupid blockers to make you make you pay for stuff i feel like just having lots and lots of characters and new things available and just being able to speed that up plus with you know 100 plus characters new skins is easy you just go grab the other variations from the asset store there's your skin and then the skins can be cheap you don't have to pay artists tens of thousands of dollars to make each one right <laughs> like they don't have to be insane um is it going to start i don't know if this is going to start up or not All right I probably just need to reboot. Last time, last week, I tried to demo. Nothing worked. Everything fell apart. I restarted my computer, and then everything was fine. <laughs> so what the hell? It's it's the gods telling you to stop demoing stuff. Yeah, yeah. Big big MOBA is going to come after you. No, I'm going to come after Big MOBA and uh, beat League of Legends. That's the goal. Big MOBA. That's my target. Um, that way, if I totally miss the target, it's still probably fine. Yeah. Well, if you want to do that, you're going to have to add some Pokemon. 
<laughs> oh no, I have uh, Pokemon are coming in and anime characters. I want to have right, them all. Perfect. I want to have a little bit of everything. Like, uh, yeah, there's n- no reason you can't have some Pokemon. I mean, not Pokemon's in there. Yeah. Some Just like the <laughs> no reason you can't have orange dragons and and yellow electric dudes. <laughs> yeah, that happen to evolve and be captured. Yes, yes. Uh, there are some asset packs like that. So it, yeah, I've been having, like I said, a lot of fun with this, and uh, it is totally broken and crashed. So I can't demo that part. We'll have to demo it. Uh, oh, you know what? I could do is play my Steam version. Let's see, Steam play. I forgot. It's up on Steam now. Let me see. I'll buy it for five hundred dollars. Five hundred. Would I get a discount? <laughs> Jeez, Andrew. All right, let's see. So here we go. Log in. This is my screen showing. There we go. We'll start. And here it is on the. Uh, this is this is my beautiful terrain building, by the way. So you can run around. You can go uh, blast this guy, and switch over to my rock dude. Get a big buff, and smash him again. Or oops, that's beautiful. Or I can just take him over. So you can run over. Click shift, click and take over whatever I want. This guy's only got one roll or soul. This guy's got three, so you can switch between them and you can uh, do it on the towers too. So just a side effect. Oh, come on. If I, if I could click the tower and not the spawner, I could take it over, but apparently I'm terrible at clicking. And then on these, you can just set what spawns there, uh, set the different creeps that spawn and all that stuff. Oh, the, the gelatinous cube. It's still my favorite, Andrew. Oh, good. The big cube, just because it's set up to go. I, I think I showed you before. Um, let me see. Let me take him over. Come on. Take control. There we go. Yeah, so the cube, his ability is that he, I think I might have showed you this. He runs up and he eats things. Oh, yes. And then carries them around. <laughs> so you just go go drop them off wherever you want. And I figured to just do some damage over time while you're in there too. I just can haven't you, added that. Can you eat one of your own teammates and protect them from gaining damage while you bring them to the front lines? There is absolutely no reason you couldn't do that. Nice. And my, my thought with this game is like anything that like you could theoretically do in like a D and D style, I just allow, I'm trying to minimize rules, which really just means that I'm not checking things very much. So there's less <laughs> if statements, there's no target type check or anything else. Like I can literally, if I, well, this guy can't do it on himself, but cause he can't pick himself up, but any yeah. other character can just attack themselves. Let's see. Can well, the cube eat another cube? Um, it should be able to. Yeah. Let's see. I, I think those you... cubes have all eaten each other. They're oh. eating towers. Right? Yeah, and then the singularity will form. Uh, so now, now they're yeah. That cube just ate me. Oh no! Oh. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. You got flattened out, but yeah. And then those, oh yeah, the treasure chests are of course full of money, so you can run around and and loot them for all the cash, and then use that to buy units. So got to figure out the exact balance and stuff. But oh, like I said I want to try to make it fun and as community driven as possible. So people already have ideas, feel free to submit them, but I'm going to do a big submission push on a Monday to get ideas for characters, abilities, um, all that kind of stuff. I think it'd be a lot of fun. And then like I said, beat, beat league of legends. Eventually that's the goal. Yeah. Or come close to it. At least. <laughs> get, get to 1% of league of legends would be perfectly fine too. Yeah. Uh, well, anyways, Let's see. That's are you making it? Hold on, let's take a couple questions here. Education yeah. or to sell it on Steam? Um, both. So I'm going to sell it on Steam eventually. That's the goal or on whatever platform it ends up on probably Steam. Um, but I'm also using it a little bit for educational stuff. So it's a great source for um, video content, video ideas. And I've made all the source code up to this point available to the students in the multiplayer mastery course as well. So they're going through and digging through it and we're talking about it a little bit. Uh, there is not a public Steam link yet. They have to approve it and before it happens. So you got to wait a little while before there's a public one. Right now there's just Steam queue. So you can redeem it. Um, let's see. Any other? Were there any other questions in chat that I missed? I wasn't really looking at the the chat there, questions at all. There was one interesting question earlier. Someone was asking about the nature manufacturer stuff on mobile. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I thought maybe Pavel would like to explain how to get those working on mobile. 
I, I think that would be cool. I got to turn this off. I keep forgetting that it has sound and I only hear the sound when I do a build. <laughs> yeah. So most of our assets work on mobile without the problems. The only problem we have is always optimization. We have for both shaders, uh, we have versions for the PC and mobile versions of the shaders for the, most of our assets. And the second thing is uh, with mobile, you would have to use lower LODs than the top ones. Yeah, we mostly do f four to five uh, levels of LODs for most of the objects. Only smaller objects have, I think, three LODs, so we can use the lower ones on mobile without problems. There are quite many games that do that, use our assets, use uh, our RAM, level Lava, Forest on mobile without any problems, even on mobile uh, VR. Nice. Yeah, I did not know that you could run on mobile VR too. I didn't yeah. realize it was that optimized. Yeah, yeah, we optimize it quite a lot. Huh. It's it's a funny thing, the, the, the mobile question. I get asked with my own stuff all the time, oh, can it work on mobile? Or people will just assume it doesn't. That's the thing that annoys me the most. People are like, oh, I love your stuff, but I'm making a mobile game, so I can't use it. And I'm like... It's not blocky enough. <laughs> yeah, apparently. They, there's that misconception. Uh, but uh, but the, the thing that gets me is my human characters, I use them in my 2015 mobile game, and it worked perfectly fine, along with all the other monsters, and it was fine. Uh, and that was now nine years ago. And I'm pretty sure that the new iPhones are more powerful than the desktops from nine years ago. So um, it's it's but it's funny that somehow people still assume that m mobile projects need to be somehow blocky and basic and barren of all interesting things. Yeah, that seems to be the idea. I think it's because. Uh... That's kind of how it was when they first started, you know, when mobile games first came out for the first multiple years, you were really, really limited um, on what you could do. And that, that has changed over the, the last few years. So let's see, there are a couple other questions in chat. Um, where's the, the one I was trying to find? You talk about the network physics one? Yes. So Unity with Zahir said, how do you sync physics? And someone else was asking about, yeah, same person was asking about network rigid body. Um, so basically, yeah, just asking how you were handling. I was curious about that as well, to be honest. That's interesting. I'm trying to find it. Um, for some reason, I don't see the message in chat. I think I might just need to refresh them. Um, Zaya, so networking in multiplayer with physics. It's all server authoritative or right now host authoritative. Eventually it'll go over to dedicated server. Um, and there's not a whole lot of physics in this specific game. So in the MOBA setup that I've got, um, everything's point and click movement. So the combat and combat, everything is relatively straightforward there. It's handled the same on every system or it can just be done on the, the server. Zero physics there. Um, and on things like the projectiles, there's no actual, the, the way that they work is, um, at least the, the ones that are in there right now, they don't do a, um, a, a, any actual physics at all. They just lerp from their launch point to their, end point once they reach that end point then they fire off their events for dealing with the impacts and stuff so they don't actually do any physics as well and with um when i go get into adding in projectiles that do fire around um they'll be very similar so i mean you'll be able to dodge them obviously and they'll be a moving object but those are going to be server authoritative um but then replicated out on the client with their start time so with like a projectile what i'll do is launch it at a specific server time you send that time on the server where it launches on the clients they're really just kind of replicating that the same movement they know when it launched where it where it should be based on when it launched and as long as it's not freeform moving and doing some ai logic on the control and it's just going straight it's it's really brain dead simple you just move it along and then on the server 
server or the host, whatever's authoritative, um, deal with the actual collision. So on that point, it probably still, it may end up doing a collision. It may end up just doing a distance check from the enemies. And once it gets close enough, it'll, it'll hit them. I'm not really sure. It'll probably just be a simple collision though on a moving little uh, collider or trigger that, that's going on the server. But on the clients, it's, it's not that at all. It's just replicated as a visual object moving along from the start point to the end point and then um, if I, you know, changing out the projectile visual. So not a lot of networked physics really in a MOBA. Like there's very little at all. Um, I said the, the free shooting projectiles are the only thing and there's very few of those. Most of the projectiles end up being you know, straight to target or you know they may and when i say that they're going straight to target they might not necessarily go like directly to the target they might do like some sort of a um some sort of pattern or or some sort of wiggle or some other thing and that's easy to replicate as well it's just it doing um homing beacons and stuff or homing missiles and things slightly harder that's why those ones just don't do don't need physics so because they're always finding the target they just kind of lurk towards that target instead um hopefully that explained it a little bit and so for syncing the the navigation, you just have the nav mesh and you just set the target on the host and on every client and they independently. No. So set the target or set the target on the host. And then you can either do two things. One is send up the path that's decided from the host up to all of the clients or two, just use a, a network transform and replicate it right now. It's just got a network transform replicating it, which is not ideal for performance, but it just take like 20 minutes to go convert that over to just sending up the path. And the reason you want to do that is in case there's any, variation in the in the system sometimes they'll generate different paths and if you had a, a, the path generated differently obviously characters would be out of sync and in totally wrong places so you just have the authoritative thing send that up and then um yeah and, and go from there you just kind of replicate it and the same thing you send the the server start time of when they start walking on it so then it can fast forward along and move them to the right spot um yeah a couple more questions your i likes the multiplayer physics stuff this is very simple stuff. Um, Nick asked what the strategy was. Will it be free with in-game purchases? That's my thought. I think free, probably free with uh, in-game purchases to unlock characters, but maybe not. Maybe it'll just be cheap with uh, you know, all the characters and then some skin upgrades if people want or something. Uh, I'm not super set on it right now. I just want to make it fun, get it um, to the point where it's like full-on production and uh, go from there. So, I, I mean, I hope to have it playable by everybody sometime this summer at least that's the goal if not before then it's only been like two months so gotta gotta get it done quick though i, I want to have this be like a, a six month project total unless it blows up and gets to be league of legends style then obviously it, it can get more love <laughs> okay so oh can we ask will about what he's most excited for in unity six and not confirm when it's dropping, but his favorite day and month of the year is. <laughs> Do you have a favorite a favorite thing for Unity Six? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm using I'm using Six for my game at the minute, uh, aka twenty three dot four. Um, so I'm 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 on like cutting edge beta from the hub, so I'm on beta thirteen at the moment. Uh, we're using in terms of what we're using for our game. I'm using basically the the graphics tier stuff that was put in. So that is um, a GPU occlusion culling, uh, adaptive pro volumes, and then the basically the GPU. Well, we we call it GPU driven rendering, but basically it's the switch in the in the project settings in graphics where you're um, offloading a bunch of stuff from CPU to to GPU, and so it's it it's it's sort of marketed, but it's also true um as a make faster button for graphics because it's basically just an optimization around how we render stuff uh, so i recommend everybody try it in their game um mileage will vary uh, it's it's worked out well for us we get a, a little frame rate bump out of it um and obviously with with things like the occlusion culling part um you know it's it's our you know acknowledgement of you know we've had umbra for years and we're um making our own solution to that that we can integrate with the render pipeline so because our game is in hgrp it works well for us um yeah I, I think those are the main things that i'm i'm really interested in unity 6 there's there's a bunch of quality of life stuff which i i would almost say 
people would be as excited about just because they're time savers. Like um, I was talking to a guy this morning who's working on a back and forward selection history buttons and shortcuts. And they're just one of those tiny things where you're like, oh yeah, we always wanted to have that. And always wanted to go, but like I always want to bind it to um, a bit like Photoshop brush sizes, the the square bracket keys. And it's just like a bunch of small things that also get landed with all these these big kind of showcase features as well. But that one's a, a pretty good one. Yeah, I want a back button. Yeah. I've been complaining about that recently. Right now, I mean soon. <laughs> 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 I said, look like Tech Dave likes the package manager changes. See, I like those too, where you can now see the assets yeah. you have in there and the updates available for them. It's, it's pretty nice. Mm-hmm. You have to go digging around and try to figure that out. Also, the uh, rendering thing that yeah. is in HDRP. Does it work in URP as well? Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's for both. Um, uh, yeah. As far as I can remember, yeah, no, it's definitely for both. All right. Yeah, make sure everybody it's, knows it's go check it out. i should probably enable that on mine i saw it at unite and i forgot about it and i haven't actually turned it on i'm going to bring up and find out exactly where it is in the menu just so i can quote things to you i realize i'm on like the worst machine for uh for doing this stream on because i wanted to bring up the game and some other stuff at the same time if i join again i'll i'll uh join on the PC. oh yeah you definitely have to <laughs> every <laughs> week i don't know with, with restream which is the platform we're using right now? You can I can add in another machine, right? Is, is oh yeah, yeah. Different? Oh yeah, just 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 yeah. grab the same link on the other system. You show up as well too. Yeah, I'll do that. Okay, here's the uh, article. Powell's just shared too. Let's pop that up. The official GPU rendering post in the forums. Resident Draw. That's the one. Yeah. yeah. It's not a sexy name. But it is an accurate name. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I've definitely got to reboot. It's it's hung for me. It's been reloading domain for seventeen minutes. Yeah, you need I to do that. That is not not gonna load. <laughs> yeah, I would suggest if anyone wants to use the GPU in lower totally this po- phone post. It's got lots of news. There's also some tests from uh, people using it already below, so great for And it's so. quite easy to turn on, but remember to check some things that in URP you have to be forward plus and so so on. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think it is. Yeah, I think you're right, Paul. I think it's forward plus, but then they're working on adding. Yeah, yeah, they're working on it, uh, and it's planned to be in uh, different ones too. Yeah. Yes. Nice. Oh well, yeah, I'm in forward plus now. I think so. I'll have to uh, turn it on and and see how yeah, it does. You remember that uh, if you scroll a little lower, there are four main points that you have to check in your project. These ones. Yeah. No. 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 Higher. Just below the. Yeah, you have four points right. here. Yeah. Right. You have to ch- check the batch lender group. You have to remember that it's in forward and turn off static batching because it will break some stuff and uh, check the settings for light mapping. Yeah, I'm going to go through this today or either today or tomorrow. Yeah, oh, well, so, yeah, I got to get yeah, the video. It, to run. it takes about 10 minutes, so that's not yeah. a problem to have it. Oh, we didn't talk about um, upscaling, did we? There's a no. Uh, the other part was quite cool. Um, yeah. That looks really cool. Can you talk about that? Yeah, it's called dynamic resolution in the settings. I mean, we we recur, refer to part of it as STP because we love acronyms for some reason. <laughs> well, it's also because the acronym is very long. Spatial temporal post processing. Um, so if you know about things like DLSS, so the NVIDIA thing, it's basically us making a more of a cross-platform equivalent where you can scale up and take the post-processing hit that you're doing and scale that down and then stretch it and get similar results out of it at a much lower cost um and so what you can do in in these settings i'll I'll try and add this machine to the call in a second what you can do with these settings is to um basically stack them in terms of priority so as like a fallback you can use sdp or dlss uh, depending on what you want to do with it Nice. Yeah, it looked really cool and super promising for performance. Yeah, I hope so. I hope it's uh, going to give everybody a big benefit. So I'm going to just try and add my machine and I'll just point out um, 
the things that you're that we're talking about in the settings so people can grab them in their own project too so i'm going to drop the link uh powell just shared for the feature highlights as well in chat if anybody wants to check that out and as soon as will's got another one in here we'll, we'll see it all visually Just figuring out how to do screen sharing. Oh, oh yep. Don't have it's audio. So well, there we go. There we go. <laughs> Let me just check here. Okay. You get a sneak peek of the game in the background. It's always fun. All right. So, share the screen. Mm, oh, this is where I have to open some settings in macOS. I'm sorry. This is an okay. unprepared demo. <laughs> Hey, at least yours didn't crash. <laughs> I do have to and relaunch it apparently, so that's fun. Oh man. Modern living, guys. <laughs> so hopefully what I'm about to show you will be the correct settings. I'm uh yeah, here we go. Share screen. Come on, we can do it. Here it comes. No, that's not it. Okay. <laughs> this is why I shouldn't ad hoc just do random things, right? You know, oh, I do it all the time. time. It's fine. <laughs> screen. There we go. Cool. There we go. Cool. So we'll switch it up to that one. And we'll make it nice and big. Yeah, there we go. So I've I've jumped into edit, uh, project settings. Um, I'm in HDLP. This will also be the same in your P. Um, but you jump down and you'll find a few different things. So um, one of them that we mentioned earlier is GPU resident drawer. So switching this from, it'll be on disabled by default as a new feature and you can enable instance drawing. That's what will switch on the, you know, the kind of jump from uh, CPU to GPU. Um, and then you've got GPU occlusion culling. You can check that on as well. Recommend trying that, see how it affects things. Um, Another big thing that's coming up is render graph, which I recommend people try out. That's going to give you an overview of um, well, rendering. Uh, is it in this build? I'm trying Probably to... in our analysis. Oh, analysis. Of course it is. Yeah, thank you. Um, render graph viewer. So this thing, um, yeah, has an incredibly detailed view of everything that's going on in your, your current um, rendering setup. Um, I am not a graphics engineer and I don't pretend to understand all of it, but for those of you who know exactly how it works, you can see how, um, how much detail you kind of get out of that. Um, but then the other thing I was talking about earlier was dynamic resolution, uh, which you can enable here. And like I said, you can stack these by, uh, by priority and give yourself, um, yeah, a bit of clarity around um, which ones you're going to move use first. You can choose a different mode as well. Um, that's specific to D DLSS. And um, yeah, I just recommend people try switching them on and seeing how they affect the performance. Use the the forum link that, that was shared in the chat. Um, nice. Yeah. Do you see pretty decent performance benefits so far? I mean, I know you're still yeah. kind of really I'm, on. Like I said, I'm super unoptimized right now. So... Uh, <laughs> Yeah. I, don't, I think I'm com committing more sins than the feature is solving, um, <laughs> as, as is customary. But um, but yeah, no, we we get a bump out of it, which is really nice. I'm just trying to look around my game, see if there's any spoilers to the the title. But no, you've only got the initials to go by, which is fun. There we go. All right. Well, it looks like your eye has uh, joined us. You got some thoughts on this stuff? What's that? Yeah, uh, actually a lot. I've been messing with this for the past month on and off, and I've been reading every single piece of documentation about it, even one that you cannot find on the Unity documentation. Instead, you go to the Unity um, official documentation and you look up individual things on the different versions and see what changes between version histories. <laughs> <laughs> you are literally diffing the code to find out what's going on, right? <laughs> I, I, I wish I had the source to diff, but yes. <laughs> I'm diffing the documentation on the internet. <laughs> um, 
So yeah, I have a lot to say both about the resident drawer and the STPP and um, the render graph is amazing and annoying, but mainly amazing. Um, so yeah, I have a lot here. Uh, where do I go first? <laughs> Whatever you feel most um, passionate about. <laughs> uh, I mean, start at the top, start with resident draw. Like how, how have you found it? Yeah. So I've been trying it. And the first thing that I noticed because I'm a, uh, I have a zero uh, garbage collection policy in anything that I try. I start a new project, I check immediately, there's no problems. There were no problems in the latest beta, which is great because previous betas did have problems. So yay, Unity uh, 6 beta 13 is good. Uh, if you do enable the resident drawer, there is a tiny GC allocation of like 48 bytes when you start using it. Um, but I already reported it on the thread that you have shown and they have already said that they fixed it. So yay, uh, very supportive for that. Um, as for how this works, if you read the entire thing, I'm going to summarize it very uh, quickly. What it, this does is it's looking at mesh renderers, specifically the uh, ones that don't... Um, have movement to them, so not skinned mesh renderers that deform every time that the transform hierarchy changes. Um, it takes all of those and it sees what it can batch together and then it creates the batches and then it renders for those batches, which is how you get uh, the batch render group uh, toggle. This is why it's called the resident drawer effectively. Um, and what this does for you is it makes a lot of draw calls effectively be a single draw call from the CPU side to the GPU of just like whatever could be matched together. So it's just a very easy tick for a lot of performance, assuming your hierarchy doesn't change. Because as soon as things start moving, it has to rebuild that. Or if you add new things. Um, so for static scenes, this is amazing. Because if you have like, I don't know, um, an old temple and a million bricks, individual bricks, actually building it, this is going to batch all of them and it's going to save you a ton of performance. It's also calculating some light information for that, things that go beyond me because I didn't look into it too deep, but it's great. Um, for things that you plan to do dynamically, you actually have to take special precautions if you are using the um, resident drawer. So for one example that is literally on the thread is that if you have an object that changes position per camera, it cannot be batched together with the rest because the batching happens once before all the cameras render. So for example, um, if you have a game with an object that follows the camera around, like a piece of UI that's actually 3D geometry or whatever, if you change it um, just before the camera on the camera rendering code, it's actually not going to work anymore because it's been batched for the rendering um, from the resident drawer, which is fine because they give you a component that says, this object is specifically doing this thing. Please do not batch it together with the rest. So they gave you the solution for that. It's not a scary feature. It's not like a bad feature. It's just a side effect of a very good optimization. Mm -hmm. So... You have to take that into account. Um, so I'm a big fan of the resident role. Um, there are some things that like kind of concern me, um, but I have not gotten to mess around with that. And it's specifically very advanced things regarding um, manually drawing a renderer um, for a specific render pass. So I guess I can segue that into what happened to render passes because now we have the uh, render graph. So a tiny bit of history here. Um, in Unity, you used to have a render stack of objects that needs to be rendered, and then you had post-processing at the end. If you wanted to inject anything in between those steps, you previously had no clear way to say, you go here. You had to actually make an object, have that object have um, a pass of a shader, and that object would do whatever you need to do. And we had code of like on render camera, on game objects in the mono behaviors to call things, but you had no ability to actually sort out which object calls its own on render camera uh, hook first. So it was total chaos. Um, then came the scriptable render pipeline. And like the name, it actually lets you script what actually happens. So there is now order. There is an actual hierarchy of passes you can see and inject. Um, and those render passes are the new way of doing things, both in URP and HDRP, to my understanding. Um, I did not mess with HDRP almost at all, so take all of that with a grain of salt. Um, no, so, you're great. Yeah, okay, great. So you 
define render passes and then you inject them into every single camera's uh, render draw calls as you need them. And if a pass has something to do, you just call C sharp code of everything that you want to do within that pass. There was one problem here, though, that was still not solved, is that passes did not know which uh, resources are being used. So if you started with like one texture that's holding details for a pass in a later texture, there is no way to know if the texture is safe to write to. So you had to keep a unique resource for every single thing uh, on the screen because you don't know if it's like used right now or not. If if the, only these two passes at the start in, in tended to use a, a texture of like 4K, and then the rest of the frame needs more texture space, but like those are not using it, you're just wasting resources. So what render graph does is it comes in and says, hey, for these passes, these resources are necessary. And then once you built out all the list of necessities for the frame, if a resource is no longer needed, Unity can just allocate it to something else, which is fantastic because now you're not spending as many resources. By the sheer nature of render graph existing, you optimize whatever you have as long as there are passes that actually don't need to keep everything until the end, which you don't need to keep everything until the end. Like the, the end render literally would just be the output texture and maybe whatever is uh, spatially um, consistent, so some things that need to stay for longer frames, more frames, sorry. Um, so there is that. And for doing things with render graph, you actually have to start defining the resources that you need for each render pass. So it's a bit more boilerplate to do the things that you need to do to have a render pass. But render passes were already slightly more boilerplate than just the on render camera that we had before scriptable render pipeline. It's all fine because I keep seeing consistent improvements to that. So I am a big fan of render graph. That's uh, what did I can try, say. Did you try out STP as well? Or? I have not tried STPV. Um, that said, I don't think there is anything manual for me to do because it's like it, it's basically lower render and then it upscales the post processing. Yeah, yeah passes right. So there, I don't. I don't see much that is like manual input from me required ergo i don't need to understand how the system works as much as the others yeah i think we, we've got quite a lot of benefit out of it because i'm using like a mix of volume based and global post processes and yeah just stacking all kinds of stuff on there just to make things look grungy and uh yeah atmospheric i guess but mm. uh, it means that we we get a bit of a benefit and i think what you were describing earlier as well about you know the fact that a lot of the game is static on making it a single player game um there's no proceduralism to it per se so you know we, we're getting a lot of kind of straight out benefit from the the resident draw stuff I think. Yeah, yeah to be fair it's like it's still a relatively quick process and you can probably still get a lot of benefits like if you spawn something um in a level chunk uh, the game is top down right um I'm I'm getting a face. Um, Again, uh, you were mentioning Umbra the the ARPG thing, or the, I I missed the start of the stream. So, <laughs> oh, we we just started talking about all the graphic stuff that's coming in oh, six. Okay. So we were okay. talking about yeah okay. the, the group of things. So, okay, so just in a more general sense, if you have chunk loading for your game, just as an example, and you spawn a section of a level, that's not going to be a problem because you may have a hitch as that level loads, but you're already planning to have a hitch because you're loading all the resources for the level and starting all the objects related to the level. So when that happens, then the new objects pop in, the um, the render batcher will say, hey, there are new things here. I need to make a bigger batch. Um, and then the batch is going to just be the new batch. It's just a tiny, like, addition to a big addition of the frame time for the loading of the thing but then you still get all the performance so there isn't like a real big issue uh, if you do have objects that move around it would be a bit annoying to try and optimize for um, render batching uh, automatically i'm not exactly sure what unity 6 is doing in that regard because again i didn't look into it too deeply um, but I did see a message on the forums that somebody had like a million cubes and tried to move one and it kept rebuilding the batch. So I hope this is a small problem that can be solved easily. Um, there are things that you can do to like optimize for this as far as I'm aware. So, yeah. 
entities is kind of good with that at least um well yeah that's one example but i mean it's you know generally speaking it's a, a new feature but it's been in the works for at least a couple of years as far as i remember um so they've tested nice. it with, with all sorts of scales of project and genres and, and things like that so i'm hopeful that you know like you saw in the forum each time these things come up they can they can learn more about how people want to use it and then uh, you know million cube dots game will be successful too yeah um and, and <laughs> just to like a strange game <laughs> well tell me a lot more than you that <laughs> um so just to clarify further for uh, everybody mm -hmm. listening um when you use the render um, the resident controller, it doesn't actually do anything for the rendering of visual effects, no particle system, no anything like that, because those things, by their nature, are not going to be affected. Like if you read the actual post, it says it's literally affecting only the mesh renderers, exactly the things that don't update a lot. Um, so. If you have like moving objects like rubble and stuff, don't worry about anything happening to your drawing because that's using the exact original code path that it used. And that's why you why it's kind of <clears throat> combined with a bunch of different things like STP um, yeah. and, and other optimizations because it's like recognizing a bunch of bottlenecks that we had in graphics and trying to level everything all up in the, in the same go. But it's more just the order in which they landed. That's why we were, like internally, we talk about it as like tier zero, tier one, tier two as a, as a set of work that the, the teams um, all collaborated on because um, we wanted to make sure everything was, you know, cross-tested with everything else. Um, that's the challenge of a kind of a global development um, development teams. But uh, but yeah, so they, they're all landing together. And so hopefully you'll see as six rolls out, you'll see kind of improvements to those all the time. And there's there's stuff that's that's not in the current betas yet, if I remember rightly. But you'll you'll see those things uh, coming too pretty soon. Well, there are a lot of um, amazing things that are already in the betas that are like silent heroes that almost nobody's talking about, and I'm hyping it like on them like crazy. Uh, so give us some examples. I'd love to, I'd love to hear what what you consider that. I, I was I was very boringly talking about a back button earlier, which <laughs> I want the back button. The, that's oh, yeah. that's me. MVP for sure. Yeah, but the best thing. Doing that's been added to Unity in the past few years from what I've seen, and I have a lot of things that I've seen in Unity, is literally the renderer layers. <laughs> the separation between physics layers definition and renderer layer definition is huge. There are a lot of things that you can do with that, specifically for the kind of visual effects that I'm looking for in games that are like incredibly frustrating to do until this was added. And I've been messing with this a lot, and I'm finding constantly that there are new ways to use both the render passes and the render layers together to do very, very fun and very easy visual wins. So, yeah, yeah, um, I'm using I'm using that in our game because we have because it's all set in the dark, and I want the character to be highlighted when they move, so you can tell that they're making sound and becoming more visible, but you don't want it to be. You don't want them to carry a flashlight or something. So I used render layers just to specifically light parts of the player. So it's nice and subtle. Yeah, I, I was quite pleased with how easy it was. And I kind of looked at it. I was like, oh, I normally use you know layers for that. And you've only got a certain number of layers. I was like, oh, wait, there's a render layers feature. Oh, shit. That's great. Yeah, and there is a lot of stuff that you can do with it, like beyond just assigning things to different layers. You can actually manually adjust it and then... Um, with the scriptable render pipeline and render passes, you can actually say, hey, call for this layer that I actually just changed a few objects to put into this layer, then grab them all, then render only those objects, and then, you know, do the thing that you need to do. So it's like a per render pass um, unique allocation, because right now you cannot create, like, a collection of objects that you can render specifically for a render pass uh, easily, you have to assign them to some kind of callable macro of things. Like they are within this layer to that layer, they use this sort layer, which by the sorting layers in 3D are overpowered, something that I have not seen literally anybody talk about. <laughs> can, can you describe overpowered in this context? So something that is in every Unity renderer, but is not used in 3D almost at all, to my understanding, is that the render order of an object is still a field. 
Now in 2D, this makes a lot of sense because you want some objects to draw before others, even though they are on the same layer and the same sorting layer. But you can still assign these details to a 3D object. Now, this wouldn't matter at all because the depth pass exists. So the second object that is supposed to be like in the front now is still behind on depth, so it still draws behind. Until you can start filtering only this layer to that layer in the render pass, which then you can start putting that object in the front. So it's very fun. <laughs> so, so you're cheating with a 2D feature with 3D? It's it's not a 2D feature. It's the render order. It's actually the you oh, yeah. asking for this object to come into the render la later, and you can just like use that. And yes, I I will admittedly say this is hackery in Unity. Yeah, I don't exactly. enjoy hackery um, for the sake of it. What I want to do is to be able to say, "Hey, draw my object, please." And Unity doesn't give me that option. <laughs> and I've been asking for it, and I've been putting it on threads, and I still don't get it. And there are a lot of small things that you don't get if you don't go through the entire rendering process in Unity. So, for example, uh, lightning and um, I forgot how they call it. Atmosf not atmospherics. There is a um, there is a name for this um, for the ambient lighting information of an object. So that's kind of something that you don't get when you try to draw a mesh instance. You have to actually set all these variables yourself and they are not exposed to anything except like the Unity shader and the entire code to say, hey, use these lights, please, because I'm trying to render this object with these lights. You cannot do that in Unity right now. So this kind of uh, feature set does let me do that. So I'll take it. <laughs> fair, um, fair, fair. Yeah, and... and Again, this is like good stuff. It's not bad stuff. The fact that we can do this is a good thing. It's not like in an ideal world there would be something better. No, it's not necessarily that it would be better. It's right. just like it's one way of doing things as opposed to another way of doing things. What um, are these other hero things that have popped out to you? Um, so the global shader uh, variables um, that oh, you can yeah. now define. It's, mm -hmm. it's huge because it reduces offering time a lot. You can actually start adjusting things that you know are going to be applied in multiple things without having to create your own editor um, to do that and trying to understand how it interacts with the entire set of the Unity ecosystem. Um, so I'm a big fan of that. I, I have a very big grudge against things that are difficult to offer just because there is no good tooling for them. So yeah. the tooling improvements in Unity 6 have been amazing. And I'm very thankful that we're getting them finally. Awesome. Um, hmm? Great. Yeah. Um, the other thing is multiplayer play mode is actually like maturing, even though there are some regressions. Um, I think I told you about that in private. You were previously. sharing yeah. feedback at length, which I'm going to do something with on Monday. <laughs> yeah, but uh, the thing is that the multiplayer uh, play mode 0 0.3 is still working in the latest Unity, and it's still working good, and it's still the best feature since light spread in Unity before the render layers um, got into the <laughs> mix. It's like they're competing in different fields, you know? Uh, <laughs> yeah, they're like they're, peers, like cousins. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but they are both great in their own regard. Like multiplayer play mode is straight up the thing that reduces offering time in a multiplayer game is the most. There is not a single feature in the entirety of Unity that has cut down this much development time as multiplayer play mode. Not yet, but yeah. You're when right. it works. <laughs> I, I, I did not have any issues with multiplayer play mode to the extent that you... But you're still on point three, right? I keep going back to point four. Yeah. To yeah, I've been working with point six, and I, I just sent over a bunch of info on the issues that I've had with it. It seems to fall apart so, if the project's any kind of big. Hmm. Um, I have not experienced that, but then again, I'm using relatively low poly models. So, yeah. Um, on the 50 gig part, project, it fails every time. So. <laughs> yikes. Um, on the 1.0, it works. It works okay. It's just not as I deal on very small and minor things mm -hmm. that don't um, harm anything if you have two monitors. Let's just say that. So it's very small and minor things. Like when you close and open play mode, Unity's extra player windows for multiplayer play mode will close themselves and reopen themselves. Yeah. The reason that they do that is because Unity has a layout system, and that layout lets you see like the game view, the hierarchy, the console. And they are saying, we have 
two sets of options for these. So if you are in not in play mode, you probably only want to see the console. There is no need for an extra game view. And if you are entering play mode, you want to see the game view because like this is multiplayer play mode, right? So this is um, the way that they have chosen to do it. They give you two sets of layouts that you can customize, and then they call a method to switch between them. Now, in an earlier version, they did this without closing and opening, but then they decided they're going for the main route, the main method call in the Unity editor itself to do that. And if you ever try to use the shortcut to switch layouts in Unity, you'll see that the window closes and opens like because you changed your layout. So this yeah. is what they're doing, which is fine. Yeah. It's just a bit of an annoyance when you see the window pop in and pop out if you just click play mode and close. And oh, you yeah. can do that very quickly because we finally have like the no domain reloading and it's actually gotten faster as Unity uh, updated. Unity 6 in regards to enter play mode and exit play mode time is extremely fast. So that's a good thing yeah. mm. as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I found the same. It's relatively quick except for, like I said, occasionally it just starts to bug out and then it gets slow and then I restart the editor and then it's fast again. But like I said, I, I got a ton of plugins in here, so it could be any one of those or, or something with uh, the latest beta because I'm also on beta 13. So try to stay up with the, the most recent beta and hope that it's stable enough. It's it's good enough as long as it's not released. That's always my thing. Like I, I will update constantly, stay on the bleeding edge until the game is out and then I, uh, I used to do it even after the game was out, and then I pushed out a Unity 5.5 update that uh, broke collision in the game randomly for no reason, yeah, and it totally destroyed the the gameplay. And I spent like a week trying to figure out what it was. And it was just a a small bug in 5.5. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So um, now, it just, as long as the game's not out, I'll update. <laughs> and you reminded me of another Silent Hero that's actually kind of huge for custom editors um so you previously had um editor attributes that let you change how um a serialized field draws like the range field for like um having a slider for uh, flows or ints um in the latest unity uh you can actually finally affect collections which is something you couldn't yeah. do before <laughs> um you you could do walkarounds by like having a serialized class and ha then having the collection inside it and then drawing the serialized class but you're actually increasing the access um cost for that uh, internal collection just to have a custom renderer which is not mm -hmm. ideal you're actually changing the underlying code which you never want so having an attribute actually change how the collection draws is great. <laughs> um, very thankful for that. Again, Unity 6 does a lot of good stuff. Yeah, that's a, that's a nice one. I, I've been a big fan of the Unity 6 updates just for the UI in general too, though. I feel like it, it feels a, a little bit cleaner and smoother and easier to use. And we were talking about the package manager earlier too. Have you enjoyed the new differences in there, URI? I do like seeing um, the bigger sections for the tabs and like having it cleaner, more cleanly laid out. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have any problems in using it, but I also didn't import a lot of packages in Unity 6 yet because most of the projects that I'm making are like small. Okay, let's see what's going in this beta. Oh, this is great. Oh, this is nice. I don't like this. This is a bug that I'm going to report. And then like I'm going to try and do a thing here, and I did the thing. And mm. This is like every tiny beta that I see that has something interesting in it. So the latest beta I tried is beta 13, and I'm eagerly awaiting um, to reach the zero GC for uh, Resident Oil, and then I'm going to try something more extensive with that. Um, so <laughs> with regards to the Resident Oil, I actually have like a use case that I'm thinking is going to be quite nice mm -hmm. for it, which is specifically um, a lot of the things that you get on Asset Store, for example, are modular pieces. And modular pieces are great until you try making a big scene mm -hmm. where the performance dies because it's all separate <laughs> objects. Um, so colliders are not solved with the resonant drawer. So that's mm -hmm. still going to be a problem because if you have like a, a million um, one by one meter uh, floor tile, it's not yeah. going to solve that for you. So I still have to optimize for that. But for the rendering, this is actually pretty fantastic. Like on the level of I can actually make a mountain and put a lot of rocks on the side of it to give it like extra depth and shape it out and not actually pay any of the cost of like actually having 
this many separate renders for the mountain. Now, it's arguable that if you're not going to get like really close to the mountain, is, does it really matter? Can't you just have a lower LOD for it? But I'm going to try and get closer to it, <laughs> and, like have actual interactions with it with just simplified colliders. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense with like all those assets too that have samples that are those modular ones and it's going to make those not perform terribly anymore, which is, is nice, or at least make them better. Mm -hmm. perform better on the rendering side if you still have yeah. the colliders you're still missing on that yeah the, the collider thing i feel like is easy for most people to solve though because majority it's, of it's them it's going to be like build out a couple basic colliders yourself so colliders are like the silent poison that unity has because you don't understand that there are problem because it's a death by a thousand cuts and you're going to have a bazillion colliders in your scene before the time you actually realize oh shit the colliders are the problem in the scene so yeah yeah, yeah people but, I mean, that's an easier one to solve than the rendering one for most people because they, they can replace the colliders combining yeah, yeah, the meshes. So. <laughs> oh, I, I guess it depends yeah. on their level design. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I was going to say, often people will make mistakes of, you know, doing things that cause physics recalculations that they can't see. So whether it's like, oh, this thing should have a rigid body on it. So the physics system knows that it's, it's going to be moving or it's moved or any of that kind of stuff. But, um, yeah, it can be tricky. Hmm. Oh, um, actually, you reminded me something uh, in regards to that. Well, not specifically that, but earlier you were talking about uh, network for game objects, and there have been big updates to that as well. Um, I've actually yep. been reading the documentation on that and failing to find more documentation than... Uh, <laughs> okay, so <laughs> small um, journey here. I've been looking at network for game objects a lot because I want to make a multiplayer experience. This is why like, I'm saying that uh, multiplayer play mode is the best thing since sliced bread. It's specifically because it lowers the offering time for uh, making the multiplayer experience. It's like it's great for that. I really cannot find anything better than multiplayer play mode. Netcode for game objects is very convenient with play mode because it's Unity's default solution for networking, and it works with multiplayer play mode. That's like that's why they're in the documentation they're shared together. It's a tool for uh, showcasing um, netcode for game objects at minimum. Um, so I tried to use netcode for game objects multiple times. Every time I try it, I find like a bug or two and I report that. And to be honest, it's the best experience I had in reporting bugs in Unity because netcode for game objects actually has a public GitHub, which has a ton of uh, pull requests and um, uh, issue reports. And the developers are actually responding there as opposed to a few other repositories of Unity that uh, I did not have this experience. Netcode for game objects, I actually had a good experience uh, reporting to. So I'm actually like actively involving myself with it. Um, and I've seen that there are new features coming uh, with the latest like uh, displays of Netcode for game objects, like the shell authority, uh, mm -hmm. distributed authority, sorry. Um, and something that I've not seen talked about is anticipation, which is apparently coming in uh, Netcode for Game Objects 1.9, which is not released yet, but there is a branch for it on GitHub. And there is also a, a light, uh, there is a bite-sized samples uh, GitHub for Unity, uh, for Netcode for Game Objects. So it's like samples that showcase how to do certain things. And they actually did include a sample for anticipation. And I have a lot of thoughts about that one, so. <laughs> oh, wow, I didn't know that was there. I'm gonna check that out this week. Yeah, so just for some um, expectation matching, I guess. Um, when you have an object in multiplayer and there is lag, there is going to be a conflict of did you actually dodge a bullet or not? Something that you talked about earlier. Mm. And one of those conflicts is, hey, that bullet was shot 0 0.3 seconds ago you stood in that place, you should have been shot because like, the bullet would have hit you. But on your side of the client, you actually moved during that time. So a few things developers can do is that they can speed up the bullet 0 0.3 seconds from the moment it's been shot. But then if you were like really close to it, actually it would spawn past you and then the effect you see is wrong. And even if you do that, the time that it takes like for the result to actually reach um, back to the uh, owner, 
uh, is going to be like mismatched with your own lag. So you actually have to add twice the travel time, so 0 0.6 seconds. And mm -hmm. it has like its own issues. Now, with anticipation, you actually get like the ability to say, hey, this is the last update I received, correct things so that they look um, matching to that 0 0.4 or 0 0.6 uh, thing. So it doesn't do anything beyond that. Now, there is an anticipated transform and an anticipated transform example that show exactly that. When they have like a little ghost that show you where the actual authority of the object is, as opposed to the visual um, object that you see. So that's great. The problems. <laughs> um, it's a very open-ended solution. It doesn't do almost anything by itself, which is good. It means that uh, things that you don't like will not happen, which is fine. The problems come when you actually try to start using it for more than just anticipation of visual effects. So one thing that uh, is pretty big and desired in networking that netcode for entities has, but netcode for game objects does not, is predicted physics. You cannot correct physics um, in the current model of anticipation, which is fine. It's just an update for netcode for game objects. I'm not expecting like full structure. Um, no. The thing that it does is it's basically going for any object that has like an anticipation thing and it just calls the uh, only anticipate hook on the components of that object. So mm -hmm. you can write your own implementations, but they will not be called for every single tick that you get. They are getting called for like once per object. So it's not like everything goes one tick, everything goes second tick, everything goes third tick, fourth tick, fifth tick. It's once per any object, and that's it. So you cannot re-simulate physics for this. But what you can do is register objects to a prediction a reconciliator thing, and then you can just let that one object call on re-anticipation, and then this object replays everything. But it's basically you have to implement your own solution, which is not as nice as some other things that are available. Um, I know that Photon Fusion has something for it. I know that Fishnet is working on something for it. I heard that Miro is working on something for it. So I hope to see uh, Netcode for Game Objects get something for this because like, this is going to be like the big thing that makes everything way better. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, for like multiplayer synchronicity. But then again, Netcode for Entities is like, the best one here because it's like straight up implemented it out of the box. It's just it's the entities are still hard to work with. Um, yeah, you just have to change your total workflow, but you do get the benefit. Yeah, that looks cool. So you said the 1.9 is up on GitHub now? Yeah, it's up on GitHub, but it's still not a release. So right. it's not in release status. Um, yeah. And then uh, in 2.0, the two experimental branches for it right now. I'm not sure exactly what's going on there, but that one has the distributed authority as far as I understand. I cannot find anything about this. I really want to try this. I cannot find anything about this. I'm trying to get from the diffs how you're supposed to use it. This is like the level I'm dealing with. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, uh, I've, I've looked into that a little bit. We'll have to talk about it sometime real soon. I've got to take a call. I'm going to AFK a few minutes. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely going to ask Chris, my friend who works on the um multiplayer team uh about a couple of those things uh, hi chris i'm sending you this video right now <laughs> <laughs> you're right um the, the so as you know i i i'm a fan of those buttons that you just click and suddenly things just work better that's my style of game dev the easy button um but you're talking about this rendering stuff earlier and i was thinking shit this sounds like i'm gonna have to learn this stuff and and use it for um my project is one of the big things I always face is I, I have a game that the characters have to be portraits and I want those portraits to be 3D so that they can animate and move. And so I have to use multiple cameras, throw them up far away, use backgrounds and all this stuff. And it sounds like these rendering options that you've been talking about might be solutions for me. Yes, they might actually be that. Um... So, for context, uh, people who have not seen Legend of the Stones, um, the actual uh, character portraits that you can see as you play 
uh, showing the characters' expressions and the lighting conditions that they are in as you explore a level. So if you enter a dark dungeon, all the faces are darkened down, and if you are in a bright forest, all the faces are brightened up. Um, and to do that, you have to know what the light level in the scene in that point is. Yes. The problem is you cannot get this kind of light information easily because you either have to find all the light sources around the character, calculate how they would be with regards to light drop-off that is not like easily available to a user seeing a light component. And you also have to know the shadowing condition, which means you have to find occlusion for any renderer that would like obscure the light. So if you do find the light, but there is a wall between you and the light, there is absolutely no way to get that kind of information unless the wall also has a collider. But if it's just a renderer, it won't have that, but the light is still blocked. So... Mm. Um, mm -hmm. and so one of the easiest solutions to do that is to just have a camera rendering at that character the problem with that is the full camera rendering only a single character yeah. uh, and if you want to use HDRP you can't use more than one camera so you get oh, kind right. of stuck <laughs> wait but uh, the yeah. last time I used HDRP it was like 2019 and I think I did have two cameras but post processing was broken unless you changed like one line that kept writing like to the, one of the buffers so it would look like the post-processing broke because it like threw black or something i don't remember the details yeah there's definitely one now because that's that's what i hit the other day i was trying to make uh some effect oh i was trying to make occlusion so you know character runs behind tree cameras between you and yeah. the tree is between you and the camera and uh, i was thinking oh well i'll just make another camera and i'll render the thing over the top and it's like nope need to use custom render pass and figure that out so i'm learning all about that stuff right now yeah yes you have to uh, uh, hrp is problematic with multiple cameras and having fun with them okay so in regards to the depth uh well sorry in regards to the occlusion effect there are a few things here um first off unity has a built-in uh, draw object pass um that you can use and they actually have a great tutorial for that it's on the urp um, documentation, I think, um, that actively shows you how to draw things that are occluded by other things. Um, so I do recommend looking at that. Um, it's ba it's basically letting you like pick a material, pick any object that's occluded by this kind of depth with this kind of like um, culling filter, which culling filter means like you can use the render layer or whatever else we talked about before, and straight up just render with the material. And that's I great. That tutorial, it's great, but it's there's not parity with HDRP, which is where I got thrown ah, off. Okay. Because the passes aren't named the same, so I have to figure out how to transpose that knowledge. But yeah, you're right. If you're using URP, it's a really good tutorial. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to wonder, where do you know where HDRP is actually different? Because I'd love to figure that out now. <laughs> Um, Not to the depth you need for this conversation, no. Okay. <laughs> you know uh, way more about it than I do. I, I might look into this later, because now I'm curious. Uh, so I'll uh, let you know if I do. Um, and yeah, Andrew is now showing the portraits just here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there you go. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, Andrew, is this four full camera renders just for those portraits? I believe it is. If I'm not Yikes. mistaken, we can dig yeah. into it. We've got our right. So the, okay. The portraits, yeah. Okay, so a few things on how you could have optimized this, and none of them are very nice and easy. So, <laughs> uh, first off, Unity does let you manually render meshes. There is no need for you to render an entire camera pass just to render one more object. That's it. It's kind of now. Uh, but uh, instead, you could have just called like draw mesh or draw mesh instance or draw mesh instance direct, uh, assuming that you actually have the meshes available. Um, and you you should be able to because you know which character you are actually trying to render. So you just get all the renders and then you call that and you transform the um, camera matrix for that specific render. Not that great, doable. Second thing you can do um, is an actual render pass, but which render pipeline are you on? Because it's important that I know. This is built in. For maximum compatibility <laughs> for asset store sales. <laughs> okay, so a few things here. Um, everything that we just talked about does not apply to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think this is this is going to be the my project uses this in Unity six thing. While anything I put on the asset store still you know has maximum compatibility for the for the masses. Uh, 
in the end. This project I'm showing in particular is agnostic to how you end up drawing the avatars. So there's that. But um, but for my project, it's my project itself will not be on the asset store. It's just the little bits and pieces, all the systems I build will. And luckily, the actual drawing of this 3D portrait does not require. It doesn't matter what version, how you draw in this, you know, portraits, avatars thing that I've built, which is on the asset store. So. so I'm trying to remember how you would do this with actually built-in pipeline with optimization in... Uh, you don't. In so, uh, no, no. So a few things here. You can still cull down the area that you're actually rendering because that would actually uh, help you a lot. Re rendering a full screen texture and then sizing it down for just this portrait is um, not great. Uh, you don't want to render five full screens. You just want to render the small slice that you're actually rendering. So you have to pick, to pick like a good output resolution and then just set the camera up settings to render only that. Uh, that would save you a lot of effort. Um, I don't have a good uh, follow-up for this aside from the things that I already mentioned. Granted, this is in built-in. <laughs> uh, at least not off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, in regard... It, yeah, it's, Andrew, it's only built-in or do you do different versions for European uh, too? No, so th this is, I think, a, a clarification on on the uh, the... What I'm showing here is the... A portrait avatars package which is which has examples of both 2d and 3d portraits um it's not itself so this system is not how to draw 3d avatars in unity it is a portrait that can display an avatar how you draw that is you know this is one way obviously but you can draw it any way you want and that is the goal of this so it doesn't have um, I don't think this has a, a URP version because there's nothing in the portraits themselves that are care about URP or HERP. You can just convert the shader to a standard lit shader, I think, if I'm not mistaken, which I could be, but who knows? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and why I'm showing this and not Legend of the Stones is currently I don't have the portraits working in Legends of the Stones, I don't think. So... I couldn't show it. Yeah, so if you were to use uh, the render layers, what you could do is just say, hey, render um, this set of characters. That said, I don't, I'm not sure how the lighting information would interact with it because I think the lights would not get like occluded for that specific object um, because the actual walls are not included in the uh, render request for that layer alone. So they would still not be occluded by the walls, which is something that you do want because yeah. otherwise we get that slight leak issue. That's um, that's that's actually why these are so small here. So yeah. these are tiny ass characters because if you go close to the wall, they 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 the they would have an issue. But if they're really small, then they actually don't go through the wall. And you know, <laughs> you don't know how big they are because you don't see the background, you just see them and yeah. they gather the light still, nonetheless. Yeah. Um, another thing you could do, and I'm not sure how this would interact with your current setup. Um, there is a way to sample lights. I have not found a good way to sample lights. It's very convoluted. Um, I, I really need to Nor I. The the, my yeah, my only thing, I have a shader that samples, and I think this one does have a URP and HRP variant, if I'm not mistaken. I have a sa shader that samples the light, it just downsizes the color. And it's mm -hmm. not fancy. It gives you an average color rather than giving you the exact directions of every light and that you can mimic in some 3D virtual world, if that makes sense. It's, yeah. It, it, was, it, was, it was a challenge I spent a couple of weeks on, actually, and ended up being happy that I got something out of it, but it didn't get what I wanted to get. I wanted to be able to, like pass the light information through, sample the light information at a point, pass that to another thing and recreate it somehow. But that was just above my my, my skill set. A slight tangent, but I was wondering if any of you have tried the new um, adaptive probe volumes stuff, APV. Uh, yeah, so I have tried it. 
I had problems with it. I kind of quickly gave up on it because I do understand how this works and I do find it quite nice, but I don't need it right now for my current thing. Um, okay. So uh, conceptually, for those listening who don't know what adaptive power volumes are, Unity has lighting. Uh, lightning in uh, real time is very difficult to calculate, uh, assuming you have a lot of sources of lighting. Um, so, uh, an old solution that Unity had since almost a very early version, I think, four Unity four. It was four, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, Unity had uh, probe volume, uh, probes. Sorry, uh, light probes, and light probes were like points in space that would calculate the light level passing through that point, cache it into memory such that when you load a level, you have the lighting already calculated in advance and things that would be going around in the scene instead of trying to calculate the light points, we just find the nearest point or a group of them and interpolate the lights and just use that lighting. It's a very um, easy optimization to get a rough amount of light um, shown on the character rather accurately. That said, it was lighting per object and not lighting per pixel uh, as a start. So if you had different um, light um, levels from different places on the character, like a red light here and a blue light here, um, you actually couldn't get like the full lighting effect uh, using probe volumes if there was no probe on the exact point that your character is standing on. So you were incentivized to distribute a lot of probe points around the level, which is not how the solution was meant to be used. It was done in a time where computer processing power was like way weaker, and it was an actual optimization, but now it's like a loss of quality, so you still want to keep like the optimization, but you can't easily distribute all the points. So if you look at the asset store, you'll see a lot of solutions that are trying to distribute a lot of points for you um, so you don't have to worry about it manually. But that still misses the point of how this entire thing worked. And so, interadaptive pro volumes, which just say, hey, we know you are buying assets that are distributing points on the map. Here is something that distributes the points for you. And also, this is ready for the next generation of actual rendering, which means this is done on the GPU side, the loading and saving of this light information. And then you can load it in with streaming. So if you have a big world, you can stream in chunks of lighting. And even better, if you have different times of day, this solution offers baking multiple light maps at different light configurations and then loading them in via streaming to replace lighting. So um, one of the features of adaptive power volumes is if you have two light levels like day and night, you can actually blend between the values of those two probe volume uh, caches mm -hmm. to say, hey, the lighting actually changes, and then you can actually have that. And if you have a level with things that uh, can be spawned into it, but not dynamically, so for example, if you have um, an Assassin's Creed kind of base or a division, a Tom Clancy's the division kind of base, and you unlock an upgrade for that base, and that base adds like new lights and a new table or something, and that table will block some of the lighting, you can actually bake uh, probe maps for that uh, base without the table and probe maps with the table and the lighting. And then you can just replace those maps. And then suddenly everything still looks light with, uh, right with high quality lighting, even though you just use two maps that are still relatively uh, optimized. And also the power volumes come with like an optimization to lighting. So you can actually have a lot more fine detail um, between. Uh, so, so it's basically sampled per pixel now instead of per object, which is like high quali higher quality look. Um, and there is also a mode for per vertex, which is a nice optimization if you're like on the lower end these days. Um, so yeah, that's basically adaptive for volumes. Um, there are still things that are missing from that. So you cannot bake at runtime, which is something very con con <laughs> convoluted to do anyways <laughs> um, with how the solution works. So you cannot do like a, dyna a dynamic base building solution with this just mm -hmm. yet. Um, and even though it has like uh, exposure to the sun kind of uh, solution going for it, um, I have not found a practical way to use this still. There's like the, the things that Unity did for it, which are nice and great and like uh, let you have like ambient lighting uh, leaks. 
um, done in a nice way, but I've not found a way to actually use this yet, so I kind of gave up on it rather quickly because most of the games that I do are dynamic bases. So, and also I try to stick to like lower size assets because I'm not doing anything actually to be distributed. So I don't actually need like the long iteration time just because I have an asset with a 4K texture that keeps wasting my time. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I have. I haven't used it yet either. It's mostly because, well, we have. You know what happens with a, an optimization optimization like that? You kind of pick it up when you need to. We haven't, yeah, haven't pre-optimized anything at all, and it seems to be ticking along just fine with the size of level that I've got. So I haven't really bothered. <laughs> we tested it uh, a little, but uh, we are uh, planning to do it more with Unity Six and everything uh, to get it all new technologies for that uh, as biggest scenes like modular castle and check what we can take uh, with it and how fast we can make the modular castle with that and then gpu doesn't lower with the adaptive club volumes and so on what we are waiting for six are you waiting for like ga of six or are you waiting for, for the uh, for for, for the play oh, okay. we are not touching uh, beta because we have too many assets too big assets yeah, and uh, then adapting beta versions and changing everything with them, it takes just too much time. Fair enough. Um, uh, sorry, I missed the last few minutes of the, the stream. I had a exciting tax call. It's okay. Yeah. You're able to Always the most fun time call time. of the year. <laughs> it was actually a good one, though. So. Oh, good. You know. So, uh... Yeah, what else is there that's actually fun to talk about that I have in active memory? Um, <laughs> hmm. uh, so in regards to multiplayer physics, you mentioned that earlier. Um, and I actually had something to say about that, which is specifically um, when you spawn an object in multiplayer, it doesn't actually have any like inherently important traits that you actually need to sync in multiplayer. Like the only time that you actually care about a rigid body synced in multiplayer is if you're trying to do calls specifically um, to detect whether that object is in range of something um, or whether um, this object is actually trying to do a full simulation. But a lot of games don't like don't need the things that would be simulated uh, physically to actually actually be synced like mm -hmm. the man, it's in the minority numbers most games have authored movement which means you directly control how the movement will happen you don't exactly need to sync the physical traits of that movement just that the movement happened visually because on the other client that's all that actually really matters the, where this enters like dirty territories with the anticipation for example um, the physics uh, will not actually like do the full simulation required um, for re-simulation. So you, if you have like an, an anticipated transform, that transform has a child rigid body, you're screwed because that anticipated transform is saying, "Hey, I'm actually anticipating and I'm going to continue moving." Uh, what is a wall exactly? Never heard of it. And the object is just like going to clip straight into the wall. And if you have a rigid body, the rigid body is going to try and resist, which is both a good effect and a bad effect, depending on what your wall is. Because if it's a non-convex collider, it will not know how to push out and it will go straight through. But if it is a convex collider, it will try to push back in. But the transform will keep fighting it as long as that happens. Um, because the transform system is not aware of physics and it does not call physical re-simulations and everybody needs to understand that. And it's something that a lot of people don't understand it already. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. What, what are some situations where you would say that you do need to simulate them? Because um, I can think of very few games where you actually kind of need that, the network physics is like simulated like that. So... It depends on what you actually care about. Like, if it's a competitive game, you actually want the physics to be as uh, uh, tight and accurate as possible. Um, so, for example, if you're actually looking for a rigid body, um, sorry, if, uh, a sphere collider for the head if, to do a headshot, uh, mm -hmm. you actually want it to be in the right place because if the transform is moving but the physics are not, and then it's not going to be accurate. And if the anticipation is like not correct, so you, you can reach situations that are not great. Like if the client decides that it needs to display a special effect for like, I don't know, an alarm showing up if an object tries to go into um, the range of a camera that should be looking for like uh, saying, hey, a criminal just entered. 
you don't want that effect lighting up when in fact the object did not do that. So it's it, there are a lot of trade-offs. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, those all seem relatively simple, though. Yeah, I guess. I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. the complexity is not directly where you want to have the physical thing. It's yeah. like you need the physical simulation if you actually intend to use the physical body for the purposes of the gameplay. Yeah. So you can't detect what's not there. So it needs to be there in order for you to detect it. The only time that you care is if you actually need to detect something. The question is how many things do you actually need to detect on the client? The, the most simple one is mouse overs. Not every game has mouse overs. Okay. That's fair. Now, here's a, a question um, going on, on topic. So, I, did you see the MOBA stuff that I showed a little bit ago? I, sh I saw a bit of it. I was just around the time that you had like water cubes um, trying to uh, fight each other. Okay, um, cool. So yeah, anyway, just basic characters moving around, some projectiles that go um, direct from a point to point, like non, you know, one, ones that can't miss. Um, and then one of the things I'll be adding sometime very soon is actual projectiles that go about flying forward that you can dodge and all that. So curious, um, and I'm sure everybody else like here, what would be your strategy for how you would approach um, adding those projectiles in? Say your game is not opinionated on anything else yet and you're just adding in projectiles and you can move around and dodge them. What would be your kind of a strategy for the attacking that? So I have multiple things to say. First off, that I actually heard you um, talking about mostly straight line projectiles and homing projectiles being problematic and not actually needing the physics. Um, you do still want physics if you have a homing projectile that's supposed to be blocked by a wall. So if you have like a homing missile and you can actually use a wall to block yourself from the missile exploding on you, um, that's still relatively attractive uh, for yes. the player. Um, that said, you don't need to think as much. Um, so if you spawn a projectile and it is homing, you just need to think its target. And like, if there are slight differences in how it paths, it's not the end of the world. Another thing you can do is you can like predict what the path would be, sync the prediction of the path, let it travel along the prediction. And if the prediction changes, you update the prediction as it's flying. Um, that's a bit more convoluted than I would like to do. Um, another thing that's like extremely simple is just honestly, have an animator on the projectile even if it has physics uh, so the one problem of an animator in unity uh, disregarding the entire multiplayer uh, aspect of this is animators don't know that physics exists they will teleport a transform to the destination under which it is um, meant to be at, at the point of animation which means it can teleport through things mm -hmm. but a lot of projectiles uh, that go through esoteric motion paths typically don't have cases where they would like stop their movement if there is a wall in the way. If I think of League of Legends, uh, the grand majority of projectiles straight up go through walls. Yeah. Um, so, like the, the grand majority of projectiles with unique movement, to be clear, uh, like lasers or whatever. Um, so, I don't see a problem with you just using an animator uh, to move that projectile around, like if it does a wiggle or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. I will suggest that regardless of anything, you just don't use um, physics bodies and just you just like program sphere casts or capsule casts or whatever you need. Uh, that's going to give you a far better experience because it's like can let you can let you force uh, certain calculations to happen in a certain way, uh, as opposed to just relying on physical events. Um, so there is that kind of trade-off, I guess. Um, but yeah, I would just use like whatever is easiest, I guess. Okay, yeah, it's uh, it seems about what what I was thinking too, and about about where I would head. Um, I got one more question. We got to go in just a few minutes, but I have one more technical question that popped up in comments earlier this week, and I've been waiting through the the week to ask everybody. Um, and I know I could probably just Google this and look it up. But I felt like it would be more fun to, to ask everybody on here. Um, user interfaces and canvases. Still using UGUI right now. Um, multiple canvases or one canvas? Or how do you separate and split those out, both for performance and usability? I've heard people say 
everything should be on one canvas. I hate that idea. Um, it's just not, not ideal for me. Uh, I split things out and I've had zero performance problems ever, but it's been a while since I did like a mobile VR game. So maybe there's a, a, a reason to do it there. Yora, you seem uh, super opinionated on this one with the laughs. Not, not opinionated. Like, Stop using you, GUI, fucker. <laughs> no, 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 no. Actually, I'm on the opposite camp. I love you, okay. I Actually, it makes me think that I can tie the entire set of stuff that I've talked about into this one conversation. How many minutes you've got? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, so yeah, everybody else should go first. <laughs> yes, one canvas, multiple. How do you split them up? Uh, I use multiple, but I get the distinct feeling that I'm I'm committing some sins by doing it. I've always used one, and I've been seeing your videos this week, Jason. Thinking, oh, you can do more than one. That's true. That's <laughs> fun. Maybe I should do that from now on. <laughs> like that makes a lot of sense. And in drawing them in a different scene entirely, that was a, a new oh. idea for me too. So it makes it much easier for me. What about you, pal? Uh, I know you got to go in just a second, but what do you do for UIs? I depends. Mostly I go with multiple canvases. If I have to optimize, then I go with one and then uh, I'm uh, checking each uh, DAO call and each element on the UI, how it works and how it's done that, if it has uh, graphics they casted, if it doesn't have the graphics they casted, and so on and so on, going through each UI element and checking everything to have it uh, as fast as possible. But then I'm going also into having atlases, checking which uh, elements of the UI are in each atlas, and so on and so on. Yeah, so then I'm going into optimization mode and I finish with one canvas with everything Atlas, especially. So mostly that it not only is the render link, but also CPU info for each element, how elements are in on CPU, how are on the GPU and checking everything. Yeah, but that's just normal optimization with everything. So um, hmm. let me start by saying, uh, Andrew got uh, uh, sorry, Andrew. I'm sorry. Uh, Will got the correct uh, way to go for. Powell explained uh, a good way to optimize all of this. Great. Um, so to start with, I just want to explain something for people who don't know how the canvases actually work um, on Unity's uh, setup for your GUI. You have canvas renderers. The canvas renderers actually exist on the things that you add to a canvas. The canvas is just a scheduler for rendering all of those things. So whenever, uh, and it actually like uh, tells them to like build their mesh properly. So a single canvas will call a redraw for everything, for every single adjustment that exists like within the hierarchy of that mesh. So if you add a new image, entire canvas rebuilds. If you add yeah. uh, a change of the text on a text renderer, the entire canvas rebuilds. What you want to do is to minimize the amounts of rebuilds when you're using canvases as a first step of optimization for the CPU. If you actually have materials that can be shared between the render calls of those canvases, uh, that's when, as Powell said, you have like one uh, canvas and then you just try to find um, what can be shared between it and you can actually separate from that, but the canvas already does some of this for you. Not that big a deal. Now, the best way to do things is to separate the canvases such that if there is something that always updates, and there is another thing that always updates, they should be in the same canvas because that canvas is already screwed to always update. If there are things that never update, they want to be in a separate canvas because they are never going to update. There is no need to rebuild them. Um, and something that is very nice, actually, in regards to Unity uh, in the latest versions is that Hugo can finally have shaders in shader graph. This is something that was missing for so many years because they didn't... Because Unity did not implement a single line that actually would have made a shader from shader graph work. <laughs> <laughs> I've been I, I've been screaming internally for this until it was added, so I'm very happy. And there's actually a uh, YouTube video. Sorry, sorry, sorry. 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 <laughs> Come back to us. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Um, uh, so, there are, so, the, so now there are actually multiple videos popping up on YouTube of people actually using um, 
you go in shade enough and i love that there's actually i, I literally saw today um a shining line effect that passes on buttons uh as a shader graph effect good is stuff. that the one i saw that earlier today yesterday um i'm not sure who actually made the video i'm sorry about yeah. that yeah um so that's a good thing to have now if you want to do special animated effects, that's the actual way to do that. You don't want to rebuild meshes in the canvas. If you have a manual shader rendering the effect, first off, you can have the effect be more dynamic. Secondly, it's actually doing the work on the GPU, which is what you want. Um, so having multiple canvases split off by order of updating, the uh, frequency of updating, and um, having the effect be mostly done on the GPU side is the best way to use um, canvases. Now, what scene they come from does not matter. And you actually have a field in a canvas to say what order it is. This will disregard the scene order. So you can still have a layout uh, pop-up in a different scene that you can just load in with all the things that you need. And I think this is the best way to offer it, as Jason, as you uh, showed in your video, which is you have a scene per element, uh, per big set of elements of a canvas that you want to have. So if you have like a combat UI, a pop-ups UI, uh, an inventory management UI, you have them all separate. And a thing I'm going to add on that is that you can actually have um, editor-only objects in Unity. Uh, if you have like the um, tags and layers. The editor-only <laughs> tag? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you can mark an object to be an editor-only thing, and you can actually have a script that says, if this is the active scene, keep it. If it's not the active scene, remove it. And that can be actually a dummy mockable object for the things that the UI that you're working on needs so that you can actually check every menu in isolation. And if it's the main game, it won't load any of these mock objects so you can actually have like the perfect experience of working with your UI in isolation without needing like custom hacker real code or like full player single tones that access like you know the inventory the combat the pop-ups and everything just because you want to check like the one pop-up menu um mm -hmm. so it's like the best way to offer things in regards to working with unity um one more thing that i'm going to add on with regard to render layers and hackery um is that you can actually set a sorting layer for um a canvas and canvases are not renderers. They actually extend from behavior, which means you can't actually call render on them, which is infuriating. Uh, but uh, what you can do is actually have a, a render pass right now that says, um, hey, draw this sorting layer only. And this sorting layer happens to only have a canvas. So now you can control where your canvas is rendered on a render layer level. You can actually draw objects on top of the canvas. And you can actually like do all those certain 3D visuals in, with a single scene, um, well, well, with a single camera. Um, that works great. It, I, I love like the amount of flexibility that render layers, sorting layers, and render passes give me um, together with the Yugui shader graph. So, yeah. Nice. Well, it's it's good to hear that I was doing the right thing. That was my my basis was always on uh, some talk I saw at Unite, I think in 2016, where they talked about exactly that, separating things out based on when they're updated. So things that are updated yeah. commonly together go together and other stuff in a separate one. And then obviously you can optimize it. You got a little bit more though? Yeah, yeah. So um, Unite 2017 and Unite 2018 both have a person coming over on stage and talking about this. Uh, he splits gold with literally anything that he says. You should go watch those presentations. I don't remember the exact links for those, but they are on YouTube. Um, he talks a lot about how to optimize a lot of things. One of the biggest red flags that you have in regards to using uh, canvases in Unity is the layout components, uh, specifically like the horizontal layout and vertical layout. The grid layout. And, yeah. yeah, the grid layout is a disaster regardless of the, <laughs> the orders. Um, so when you use those, this is basically the worst case scenario for Unity because anything that changes triggers a full rebuild of the canvas. And the reason those components exist at all is because they have... Um, Unity does not know when you change your objects. You, you basically have third-party code. That third-party code is manipulating things in the ether. And Unity says, oh, hell, something just changes. What do we do? We don't know what changes. We don't know when the changes are coming, when they will stop. We have to rebuild for every single attempt. Now, 
an optimization they did is they did is they marked the UI for rebuild and eventually they rebuild it. You actually have a method you can call to immediately rebuild it. Sometimes this is necessary if you're trying to like refit a UI element that's containing another UI element, but the contained element changed its size. Um, I'm not going to get into that though because I know Powell, you have to go. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have to talk more, do like a full um, segment or episode on UI stuff. I think this is interesting. And yep. it's like, uh, you know, it's one of the things that every, every game has and or almost every game has and needs. So I think it's, it's useful for all of us. Um, Paul, you, you said you got to go, but I wanted to quickly share the uh, the link. You've got a couple of deals coming up on the flash sales. It looks like they've got the info about the upcoming deals coming out now it's the 17th for some reason i thought it was the 16th i get my dates all mixed up yeah this looks cool yeah, you got what, what are the two things here uh mountain environment and i think the best flash deal that we could have given an environment bundle that has most of our assets in it will be on flash deal oh wow and then the flash deals do you know what the percentage is did they tell you 70 percent off it says it is it 70 okay yeah, it yeah. Says at the very, very top of the window yeah in the, oh, okay, and yeah, then I think it goes to 50, yeah. Nice, nice. So I'll drop a, a link for that in the chat. We can go check it out. That That's a good deal on that bundle. I'm going to, like I said, try putting some of your stuff back in. I just need to be not a shitty artist. I'm so bad at level design. I just like, I, I'd love to spend like a couple hours just with a level designer putting stuff together that looked nice. Um, <laughs> cool. Anyway, yeah. so yeah, go check that out if you haven't, um, and we're going to get going. Other things, uh, if you haven't seen Andrew's projectile pack yet, just came out today, yeah. or is it yesterday? Uh, yesterday today? morning. 20, okay, 20, yesterday 20, morning. Seven hours ago. Go check it out. There's a good trailer, shows all of the stuff in there, show you how to um, do different types of projectiles, homing projectiles, splitting ones. It looked like all kinds of crazy cool stuff, and sticky bombs. <laughs> bombs are available too. You can yeah, do it so yeah. Bomb. Make sure you check that out. And is the twenty dollars sale still live? I think that's gone. Did did it, did it end this morning? Mm. Yeah. Ah, uh, no, no, no. There's no, still some things is. on there. It is. It might be in. Uh, the, oh, is it still? What does it say? Yeah, it's still on. Yeah. It's still oh, on. It's, it's, it's still on. It might it might be up for another day or two. Okay. Which is I good because I, I keep forgetting. Good. I need to grab the super text mesh and, and play I around with it. Last night. Yeah, I, I keep <laughs> adding it to cart, and then I've got like. Ten thousand dollars worth of stuff in my cart, so I'm like, "Oh wait, hold on!" And then I get distracted and I forget. <laughs> yeah, go check that out. And um, if you haven't signed up for the multiplayer mastery course, you can check that out in the link too. I got the code for the MOBA stuff, and then we go through a racing game and an extraction game um, with all the lessons there. And we have live calls on Mondays and Thursdays. So next Monday we'll have our our next call. Other than that, I think. Um, we're out of things to share. Go check out uh, Unity 6 and get ready for the call next week. Oh, and Powell's got a link. I'm going to drop it in chat for the um, profiling UI stuff. So UI canvases. Go check that out as well. And then come back and uh, join us again next. Oh, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. There's one other thing I missed. Andrew. Oh, yeah, that's not for three weeks. Oh, okay, uh, you've got a big pack coming in the sale too. Yeah. So yeah. Well, days. for now, just go grab Andrew's twenty dollar pack. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's nice and cheap. That's like but a ninety percent discount. If you want the big character pack, then that's coming in twenty three days, which is nice. a long time to forget about it. It certainly is. We'll talk Probably about it later, though. I'm sure. All right. Thanks again, everybody. Um, we'll see you next week, and we're gonna head out as soon as I find the button.